Hello, everyone. My name is Dave Nawaziet, and I'm head of marketing for manufacturing and logistics segment. Today's topic is the automotive industry and their uh, interest in adoption of 5G in their manufacturing and retail operations. I'm joined today by two uh, experts in this area. First is Dr. Phil Marshall, from, a chief research officer at Taloga Research. Hello, Phil. Hi. Hi, Dave. How are things? Great, thank you. And secondly, uh, Stefan Miller, head of global automotive uh, industry at Nokia. Hello, Stefan. Hi, Dave. Great. So uh, the automotive industry is undergoing a dramatic change in the business models and their operations. Uh, consumers are increasingly looking for greater selections of different vehicle models that are tailored to meet their specific preferences. And this includes a shift to more resource efficient vehicles, either powered by uh, electric or uh, perhaps a hybrid model. Uh, governments uh, are also uh, driving the automotive industry towards energy efficient vehicles with R&D incentives and tax breaks to build uh, new electric vehicle factories and batter battery plants. Also at the same time, they're pressuring the automotive industry to reduce greenhouse gas emissions with new laws and stricter environmental regulations. Likewise, uh, the environmental groups and corporate shareholder activism is becoming more influential in making the automotive industry to be more accountable for meeting the carbon neutral sustainability levels. Adding to this is the ongoing global pandemic and supply chain issues that have severely impacted the automotive industry's ability to produce uh, vehicles resulting in um, closing of some factories in the world, at least until the situation normalizes. Uh, so to cope with these changes, the automotive industry is introducing intelligent automation and flexible manufacturing processes to become more agile, to meet the changing market demands, while being more productive to drive down costs, increasing efficiency to meet their sustainability goals. So this requires the digitalization of their factories by adding technology that allows them to collect, process, analyze more data in real time in order to be able to give them the insights they need to make better, more informed decisions. Uh, these new flexible manufacturing processes will incorporate more automated machines and robots and tools and devices that are increasingly be being mobile. And as a result, uh, they need to be connected wirelessly to their manufacturing operations. So it drives the need for wireless networks that can meet the scalability, reliability, and performance to support these new requirements. Similarly, on the automotive industry retail side, dealerships are also looking for ways to improve efficiency of their service departments, while also providing a better consumer experience when customers are visiting their facilities. As a result, the automotive industry is evaluating 5G as a technology that they can deploy in their factories and retail operations to support their industrial automation and digitalization plans. 5G holds the promise of combining the best of wired networks for its bandwidth, performance, reliability, and security with that of wireless networks for their flexibility, scalability, and mobility. 5G can also potentially simplify the auto manufacturer's operations by reducing the number of networks that are required for communications, machine control, and IoT sensing. So with this backdrop, I would like to begin our interview by asking Phil a somewhat provocative question. So Phil, why should we care? Or rather, why should the automotive industry care about 5G? Well, the first thing is, Dave, I mean, you've illustrated a lot of change, right? So you've got mm -hmm. an industry that's being transformed. We also know that the industry is highly competitive. Um, it's massive. I mean, six of the uh, top manufacturers in the world are car companies. So you've got a massive industry. You've got an industry that's being disrupted mm -hmm. um, and a lot of change occurring. Um, so... Automotive manufacturers need to be thinking about sustainability, as you mentioned. 
there's a whole shift towards uh, electrification, software centricity, agility, um, and then the supply chain as well. Very complicated supply chains um, to, to deal with. And then lay on top of that the high precision, high complexity manufacturing processes that um, uh, that they're that they're involved with car manufacturing. So I think when you take all of those components and and combine them, um, there's a lot at stake. Uh, and and certainly in in our research, we found that that um, there's significant interest in 5G, and 5G is being positioned to play a significant role uh, as car companies kind of make this transition and continue to remain competitive in the space. Okay. Uh, Stefan, any uh, comments on your side from why is the automotive industry so interested in 5G? Yes, yeah, just like as you mentioned, um, uh, the complexity is massively increasing and complexity has a different dimension. One complexity dimension is just like that all things will be connected in the future and there's a demand for higher flexibility in, in the production processes and that defines basically a new requirement to the <coughs> wireless connectivity in terms of broadband security latency and seamless connectivity also just like for the moving things mm -hmm. and the private wireless solution or private 5g just like fulfills these requirements and helps just like the automotive industry to on one hand connect all the devices and on the other hand reduces just like the complexity of the uh, of the operations meaning um Private 5G has just like the capability to, uh, in, to just like cover all the different demands. So you don't have to uh, operate so many different uh, connectivity solutions. So you can combine everything into one. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Stefan, then, you know, uh, what is the automotive industry looking at in terms of um, use cases where uh, 5G could be applied? Yeah, in this case, we can do kind of a um, um, fact check. We have installations at most of the relevant car manufacturers already on a global scale in the headquarters, as well as in some of their sites outside their headquarters. Um, further, when we when we have just like a look on the published strategies of the OEMs, we see that all OEMs consider 5G as a future wireless connectivity solution in their factories. Mm -hmm. We already see, and that's that underlies that the technology is, is just like the right path that the tier ones are already investing into this kind of technology and tier ones are known as fast followers fast followers in the, the automotive world so in other words we see an increasing number of installations also at suppliers which is finally a good indication that this solution will be relevant in the future mm -hmm. And uh, are there any specific use cases that you see where um, the automotive industry is really looking at, uh, uh, at the, uh, initially? Uh, we, we had just like a look on, uh, on, on the installations. We see just like roughly 16 plus use cases where the industry is already working on. Um, the ones where, where it's a common sense or where it's the biggest need is just like the connectivity to HEVs. Mm -hmm. connectivity to devices um, the we call it the data shower meaning the data download to the cars meaning the the software within the cars in, increases ma massively and there's just like a need for 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 better bandwidth including the mobility throughout the production process and we also see more and more some upcoming ar and vr use cases which are already in place but they can perform better with a private wireless um, solution. Okay. And Phil, uh, from your uh, discussions with the uh, automotive industry, um, what do you see as the 5G use cases that they're most interested in? Yeah. So, so to put it in context, a lot of the work we've done has been around the, the, the sort of the manufacturing process and how that's, mm -hmm. how that's uh, changing and the role that 5G plays there. And so, so what you're seeing is firstly uh, a distinction between uh brownfield and greenfield environments um a lot of greenfield sort of new factories being implemented for evs for example battery factories and so forth so you see a distinction between 
those, right, in terms of how mm-hmm. aggressive or how interested they might be in terms of adopting 5G. Obviously, it's measured, right, a very measured approach, bearing in mind the, the, the cost of any uh, operational disruptions uh, that, that might occur. So, so putting that in, into perspective, where, where we've seen it um, certainly has been a lot of trial activity around uh, sort of any sort of mobile functions that require agility. So mm-hmm. think of uh, collaborative robotics, um, human machine interfaces, right? Um, mm-hmm. And then uh, into, into some of the pr- production activities, recognizing um, particularly when you're trying to do sort of mixed, uh, you know, assembly production and so forth. So um, use cases uh, we, we see emerging um, perhaps from the peripheries, right? So the main operational functions um, are being uh, treated very carefully in terms of how you how you would adopt wireless technologies in general. Um, and 5G being really important as you start to make those more more agile and require um, that that wireless connectivity. Um, but across the board, I think, you know, if you think of it in terms of sort of data management and AI as being one category, you can see use cases in there where you're, mm-hmm. where, you know, you've got thousands of devices that are, or increased number of devices towards thousands of devices potentially within large facilities uh, requiring connectivity, uh, AI being necessary to deal with the, the, the nature of the data you're collecting from those devices, which tends right. to be sparse. Uh, real-time uh, sort of uh, monitoring control, you know, uh, certainly in that area you have have activities, but obviously if it, it the closer it gets to the to the uh, line production, um, there's there's a tendency to be very careful in in terms of how it impacts the operational processes, and then obviously a significant amount of activity around robotics and automation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, um, autonomous mobile vehicles um collaborative robots and sort of that uh, that human machine interface activities I, I think one of the things to to point out too on the manufacturing side is that you know you can't get away from having uh well you certainly can't uh implement fully automated factories so you you you're now thinking of of the role that automation for example plays with uh, human machine interfaces and collaborative robots is becoming really important because because of the uh, high precision, high complexity processes that are involved um, in the manufacturing um, of, of vehicles. Um, so that as well impacts the nature of the use cases that you like to see moving forward. Okay. Okay. So it's really these new um, operational models where mobility is becoming more and more uh, right. required. Okay, and and agility, right? And agility. So so right. so being able to be more agile, um, and and deal with with sort of yeah mobility it's, as well. Okay, um, you know Phil, uh, also, what do you think um, corporate views are around five G in the automotive industry, and is there any real difference between what corporate is thinking about five G can solve all the problems that they may have in their operations versus really what, you know, more down on the floor, the ITOT organizations at their level, what right. G can do for them. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you, you can kind of say in a nutshell from a corporate perspective, they're thinking of, you know, strategically where, where, where are they driving uh, the business, right? So what, mm-hmm. what is their strategy around, uh, a transition from internal combustion gen- engines to EVs. Yeah. What's their strategies around uh, s- s- software-defined solutions? What Stefan was talking about, you know, with the with the massive amount of data that you're going to um, be dealing with uh, uh, within the within the vehicle itself as you become more software-centric. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so they're thinking about those kinds of things. What what new factories are built and and so forth. When you get to uh, sort of the IT and the OT or the operational technology level, they're thinking about the day-to-day operations. They want things to run reliably. They know that if they have operational failures, that's going to cost tens of thousands of dollars per minute uh, mm-hmm. or in downtime. They know what impact uh, um, 
you know recalls and 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 problems with the with the product uh, have on the on the business as well. So so they're very focused on that. Um, and when you look at it from the IT OT perspective, it's almost like you can see you can almost see a sort of a, a parallel between the distinction between kind of why if you compare the two right mm -hmm. a distinction between wi-fi and 5g almost right that mm -hmm. sort of the it environment is perhaps coming more from a sort of a um kind of the equivalent of a wi-fi type of world and the ot with a much more high reliability uh, much more concern about uh, the the operational environment are perhaps coming from how we'd think of the way in which we've designed 5G, right? Which is right. the higher performance requirements, the uh, lower latency, the uh, reliability and security that that's built into those standards. So you can almost see that um, the, the, the the parallels from a if you like comparing the technologies, um, and over time we're we're looking at those worlds to converge, right? So right. strategically that convergence is, is 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 occurring and needs to occur with digital transformation. And that's where you're going to see also the sort of world of IT and OT have to come together and, and, and um, bring together integrated solutions that can work through the entire technology stack, right? So there's a lot of complexity there that needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, and one of the challenges you have, obviously, is the organizational silos that have been built around the legacy environments that um, that they work in. Right. Stefan, from your view, is uh, corporate have a different view around 5G versus uh, the, the shop floor level at the IT OT, OT level? Yeah, there's not really mu uh, mu much to add. It's just like what Phil just like outlined is, is the experience we have on, on the field. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's really just like um, on, on the shop floor itself, they're really keen on just like getting the, the processes run. Mm -hmm. um, so there's nothing to add. Okay. So, you know, one of the things about 5G is that, you know, it's a uh, standard that is constantly or currently evolving. You know, we're now into release 16, uh, release 15 being the first release of 5G. Uh, now we're into release 16, but there's uh, follow-on releases, release 17 and 18, which have a lot of good features that are, um, you know, going to be suitable for manufacturers and, and, and automotive industry. Uh, so, you know, what's, uh, Stefan, what's your view about uh, the progress that's been made on 5G and the standards? And, you know, do we have a sufficient enough uh, functionality and features that um, they can really get started in uh, looking to uh, support their digital transformation plans? Yeah, just like the short answer is yes. And the long answer is it's just like the good thing is that the automotive industry is also heavily involved in the standardization in different groups. So there's a really clear view and a clear expectations on the features, capabilities and availability of the private network. And as you said, the private wireless solution can be used as of today we already see some good implementation where existing features bring value to our client processes just like using an example outside the automotive industry because it's public and there's a lot of material available is the Lufthansa case um, uh, with their remote inspection where mm -hmm. private wireless provides just like with its high bandwidth an excellent coverage the ability to execute execute the use case and this use case is a good example also for the automotive industry um, where they just like can start to operate things within the automotive industry we have some examples um, uh, where these kind of, of, of features within the 5g network already um, enables use cases it's just like starting with a simple use case like the hand scanner um, in an outside area where the coverage is just like key. Mm -hmm. Also, the, the, the connectivity on test tracks is another example. It's a little bit outside the factory, but inside the automotive industry where this capability can be used as of today. So it's not in our proof of concept state. It's really just like operate in operational use as of today. And it's just like it's a good starting point to explore the technology, to use the, the technology and to 
should just like make take the benefit out of it and with the upcoming releases just like as you mentioned 16 17 and 18 we will then experience just like the the, the full um, capabilities and we're talking only about a couple of years meaning within the automotive industry you don't change the technology from one day to another um, having another two to three years in mind that's just like a, an excellent time frame also just like to get used to the technology and to introduce and adopt the processes so from that perspective i have the feeling that we are really just like in line also with the change processes of the industry okay Okay, good. Um, so then, Phil, maybe um, ask you a little bit of a two-part a two question that uh, maybe is um, something that sort of builds on what Stefan said. So, you know, if 5G is starting to become, you know, um, accepted as part of the automotive industry, what do you see as the biggest technical challenges in adopting uh, 5G in the automotive industry? And then, also, what are the big business challenges that they may have in adopting right. 5G? Yeah, you know, so as as we move towards the standardization five of 5G and you and you sort of implement the use cases that Stefan's talking about, I think you kind of get a better understanding of the real specifics around um, the challenges you face. But but some of the things that are important is obviously the ecosystem maturity. You know, mm -hmm. so we're developing an ecosystem and you're integrating. So again, coming back to sort of the focus of, of our research has been around manufacturing. You're integrating into to these complex environments that have a lot of other standards. Right. And right. so um, that that ecosystem maturity is important. And what I think is really compelling around 5G actually is the way in which it's designed um, uh, towards a sort of a more of an IT kind of centric uh, infrastructure, virtualization, cloudification, and so forth. It's actually really important to be able to transition it from, a, if you like, a, a, a public uh, network technology into private environments and into these different use cases. And so it can flex from, from that standpoint. But certainly that 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 ecosystem is, is important. Then from the standpoint of of the um the companies themselves what technical expertise do they need and what technical expertise do they have where are those technical experts coming from right and if you think of as i mentioned the uh it world it's perhaps coming from a, a legacy in wi-fi if they think here wireless technologies um in the ot world you're perhaps coming from more of a fixed infrastructure you know fixed uh, connectivity technology um, with a lot of standards and a lot of sort of vertically integrated types of solutions that they've been they've been thinking of so what is the uh, technical know-how and then how's the 5g technology maturing to make that easier and getting back to my point about sort of virtualization and cloudification mm -hmm. um, the ability to make the technology itself more agile for the use cases becomes really important from that standpoint and then once you think of the sort of the environment that you're going into obviously systems integration is you know is a is really important and and ensuring that it operates reliably in a uh in a in a uh a, you know a live operational environment at scale right mm -hmm. so those those become uh, sort of really important and challenging and then and then being secure right secure yep. and reliable um i would say would be you know sort of from a from a technology perspective those are some of the challenges that you that you face and that's why you see a measured approach in the way in which companies uh, are, are implementing 5g trialing 5g making sure that they really understand um, how it performs in practical environments um getting back to stefan's point around the use cases too i think um, the industry as a whole has tremendous scale um, that enables um, a lot more interest in terms of uh, ensuring that the technology will will migrate into into these types of environments more more effectively. Um, from a commercial perspective, obviously, you know we've we've talked about the the, the need for sort of um, uh, reliability and being able to uh, commercially operate. Um, in uh, operation, existing operational environments or commercially support um, uh, new environments without creating 
uh, costly disruptions, right? Um, right? Ensuring that the ROI is there. And I think what happens with that is uh, basically the sort of the migration from the individual use cases to be able to bundle together use cases and create ROIs around how a, uh, a, a network platform technology um, creates value as a whole. You know, so you have to sort of migrate out of this sort of uh, use case by use case to then be able to say, well, actually, these are the use cases. This is the ROI across all of them, all of those use cases uh, for the purposes of deploying, um, uh, you know, a five, 5G five uh, network technology, which then comes to the perceived cost. How much does it cost to implement it? Um, and that's going to be better understood over time, as well as I think sort of the the way in which um, from a from the perspective of from a commercial perspective, kind of how you implement that technology to support those stakeholders who are investing in it or who are impacted by by its adoption. And that extends well beyond the factory, as Stefan's pointed out. He's talked about the racetrack. We're talking about, um, you know, dealerships when you start to talk, you know, look at after sales support um, a, as well. So I think that becomes becomes particularly important and a challenge. Uh, Stefan, anything to add on, on your end from uh, the technical side or the business side around um, 5G adoption in uh, the industry? Yeah, it's just like from a technical perspective, they're, they're always saying the availability of, of devices is not on the on the level they would like to see it. Um, yes, it's true, just like the competition is pretty small as of today, but there are <clears throat> just like equipment, various equipment available, which allows you to start um, enabling the use cases like routers are available, tablets are available, so you can really start just like remote configure or remote control your machines already. So. I would say there is just like equipment available, maybe not yet on 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 that level where the industry is setting the expectation, but the equipment is there on the, on the right level already. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the business challenges, um, I think from a when we talk just like to, to to the senior leadership, they have just like the big picture in place and and that makes a difference. When we talk just like to the working level or just like to the people who implement the use cases, they are also asking sometimes for the for the business cases. And it's difficult to calculate the business case around one single use case. Just right. like we, you have an installation in a factory which feeds a lot of use cases. So that needs to be uh, um, considered. And they are also just like always direct and indirect impacts, meaning um, the operation of an HEV maybe just like makes them uh, really just like seamless with the handover and stuff like that. That's a direct impact where you can uh, <clears throat> where you see a benefit in in, uh, in your operations. But there are also indirect benefits like the data you're grabbing. You're grabbing the data in real time. You can do real time analytics to optimize the processes and your operations on a new that on a new level that means that the digital factory and the digital product twin can be leveraged just like on the next level and these are indirect impacts on the, on the, on the business case which are very often not considered okay yeah so it's not just an individual use case there they're going to be looking at the big picture bundling as phil said you know a number of use cases together maybe in a particular area of the factory floor, making sure that there's a business case justification for all of them. And uh, that's probably how, you know, this is going to be uh, implemented or or justified in the um, in the business case. Yeah. OK. Um, so then um, I think we've talked a little bit about uh, the initial use cases uh, in the automotive industry. So um, I don't know, Phil uh, or uh, Stefan, if there's any in particular um, that you want to mention here around the automotive industry. Um, I know, you know, we've had some successes. Nokia has had uh, some su successes in deploying some trial networks uh, in a number of automotive industries, um, factories, but maybe Stefan, you can uh, talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, just like when we, have, as, I, as I said earlier, just like we have more than 16 use cases which are under development or in use on our, on our client side, but maybe we can separate that into two 
kind of categories inside or in-house use cases and outside area use cases. Um, when we look and just like on the outside area use cases, um, we see more and more use cases coming into operations. Whereas in-house, just like within a factory, they are more likely uh, all in a kind of a proof of concept state. But this is obvious, just like you don't change your technology in a, your production process, just like within a, within a week's time. Yeah. So that's maybe something um, which I can outline outside or, or outside use cases or outside of factory use cases are really use cases which can be used or where, where we see the use case in operations already and the in-house use case or in, inside the factory use cases are in proof of concept state but really just like with a, to my understanding to a high in a, in a high maturity state already mm -hmm. so we see already on the client side a clear strategy or a clear process to implement them just like in the upcoming year maybe next year we will see them in operations as well okay I think to add to that, Dave, is as you make the technology more available, I think, you know, use cases emerge. So you sort of, you think of it as, you know, how do you migrate what you're already doing or how you, you know, what, how you perceive things should be done, right? So you think of, uh, for example, if you think of battery technology and mm -hmm. the manufacturing of battery technology, um, uh and the operational processes that themselves producing the batteries is is important, but then things like digital twinning, right, yeah. which which comes much more important when you once you start to think about sustainability and circular kind of recycling type processes, yeah. right, or or how you manage the cells and optimize the way in which the charging works, right. So now what's happened is you've you've kind of you've gone from your tra traditional world. You've, you've implemented new technologies. You've now got this 5G resource available and these use cases start to start to emerge, some in trial phase at the moment because there's a lot of ecosystem that needs to come together for those to work. And then the same with, you know, some of the areas that Stefan was talking around about, uh, you know, which, which come into sort of the after-sales support, right, and the software side of it, um, transitions from these kind of siloed worlds of what ha happens in the production and manufacturing to actually what happens right through that life cycle. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so, so I think over time, you're going to find a lot of uh, use cases emerge as a consequence of this transformation that's occurring and then develop as there's a better understanding of what 5G can actually do. Okay. For them. So it sounds like some of these tech, um, 5G use cases are more, um, more applicable and more of a greenfield new factory operations, right? Uh, Stefan, is is that the case, or, or you know, are there brownfield cases uh, for uh, existing factories to adopt five G? I think we will see brown brownfield um, 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 use cases as well. Just like we we have to look on on the process itself. You don't change a production line. Um, while a model is getting produced, but once there's an upgrade uh, of a model year or stuff like that, that's also the chance to upgrade the production line. And that's the point where we will see brownfield um, um, topics in the near future as well. Okay. Okay. So we, we talked, I think, Phil, you talked a little bit about Wi Fi and mm -hmm. uh, its um, uh, use in uh, automotive industry. We know that Wi Fi is uh, part of the uh, shop floor and their operations. How do you see Wi Fi, you know, uh, coexisting with 5G? I mean, is is there going to be specific use cases for Wi Fi, and 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 do they move to Wi Fi six, uh, which is, I guess, the current standard, or you know, do they sort of look at uh, Wi-Fi as uh, one technology for certain use cases then in 5G, maybe some other use cases? Yeah, so, so I mean, um, again, I, we, we've looked at this sort of much much more from the, sort of the manufacturing side, and obviously there's, there's broader considerations, right? Um, but if you think of, of, in a nutshell, where Wi-Fi fits is, if you like, kind of, less critical or possibly non-critical communications mm -hmm. um and 5g is really very much in those critical communications you know so where you really need that 
that that performance. And as I mentioned before, you can kind of see the IT OT worlds where there's a perhaps a higher need for critical communications and the features in 5G on the, on the OT side. Not always, but mm -hmm. but generally speaking, you can almost create a division there where you'd say, for example, your um, some of your uh, manufacturing execution systems and some of the higher layers in your um, sort of IT stack around manufacturing uh, can perhaps be supported by um, uh, Wi-Fi because you don't necessarily have some of those scalability and real-time issues that you have down in the operational environments. So there's definitely a distinction between the two. Um, and I think if you, if you look at where the digital transformation goes, um, in these manufacturing environments, um, the, the critical communications will depend more and more on, will, will require 5G transitioning, if you like, off these fixed type of connectivity scenarios or fixed being the other possibly uh, the, the legacy of where that's come from, right? So, so they, they, they'll coexist, but um, I think there's a sort of a distinct place. And, and over time... Too, I think there's a there's a need to think about how that evolves as IT and OT sort of converge, right? And I think that the, the, what's really important from for at least from what we've seen in our research from the standpoint of five G is that uh, uh, simplification of of the sort of the operational model mm -hmm. of a private five G network so that it better fits. Um, into that convergence environment and better melds with with sort of, if you like, your traditional IT world that exists within the manufacturing environment. Okay. And uh, Stefan, what's your view on uh, Wi-Fi and 5G coexistence? I, I fully agree what Phil just outlined. I think there's also just like a common sense everywhere that private 5G will simply be complementary to Wi-Fi. And as, as Phil outlined, it's just like, Private 5G will will be focused on the use cases where critical communication is important, especially in the company communication, in the combination with low latency requirements and high bandwidth, and also mobility will be one of the areas where yeah. um, private 5G will give a change, especially when we see just like big fleets of of, of devices running around um, on the shop floor. Right. And that maybe is also the, the the difference. Just like a small factory with one HEV, right. maybe five G will not have the impact. But looking just like on the on the on the big facilities with these a lot of devices, that's going to be the 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 point where five G will make the change. Nevertheless, Wi Fi will be there for non critical communication. Right, right, and yeah, the, these factories that we're speaking about are huge industrial complexes right you know right. large uh, facilities so coverage is a big issue for them and making sure they have that reliable con uh, coverage and connectivity you know for their operations is important to them yeah. sure yep okay um so then stefan you know how do we see the 5g ecosystem uh today is it you know sufficient to get things started and you know uh, do we have enough of a ecosystem, not only on the device side, you mentioned that being, you know, something that's still uh, maturing, but uh, on the partners side, um, do we have, you know, enough uh, expertise in the 5G area with our partners to be able to help the automotive industry in adopting 5G? I think there's a different maturity, just like when we look on the ecosystem, as you mentioned, it's just like the equipment manufacturer will play a big role. Mm -hmm. Um, but of course, we see also a lot of traction um, in, in just like the whole ecosystem. They're just like the um, IT network operator who right. identified operating of private wireless system is just like maybe a new game for them. So they are just like trying to increase their capabilities and explore um, our technology. And we see just like the strategy consultants who are working on, the, on what's going to be next. Yeah. Um, we see the web scalers to think about new edge services, right. which which can be enabled just like with with these local edges um, and and the low latency and the high bandwidth. So there's just like the ecosystem is is 
is simply growing to my understanding and we are helping them actively to just like increase their knowledge on one hand and to develop their use cases we have for the automotive industry one installation in the arena 2036 right. which is just like i always call it a playground for manufacturers and we help them really just like to 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 implement their use cases and we support them with them with their questions and whatever it is so it's not only about equipment manufacturers it's also just like the whole ecosystem and it's growing it's, it's um and that's what we do and and that's what i see currently yeah yeah so there is a growing um a uh, group of uh, partners and systems integrators, consultants, as you mentioned, you know, sort of working together on on uh, developing 5G for the industry. Phil, what do you see as far, you know, is, is, is there is there this collaborative process going on in other places, you know, uh, within the industry um, uh, on adopting it? Absolutely. I mean, I you know, the, the, the momentum behind, behind 5G is, is across a lot of industries is significant. I mean, the mere fact that it sort of appeared on the market a year before it was originally intended, right? I mean, we had 5G in the marketplace right. in 2019, and it was intended to, you know, 2020 technology to be a 2020 technology. So, so there's definitely a lot of strategic momentum behind 5G. And and one of the things I'd say about the ecosystem, if you don't have that tension between we need devices and you know, people saying that the ecosystem isn't quite ready or we've got to kind of push forward. That tells you that the technology is 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 actually transformational in a sense. Yeah. You know, if, if, if everyone said, yeah, the ecosystem's ready, well, then, then what is it that you're really doing to push innovation forward? Right. And so I think that natural intention between, if you like, the supply side of, of getting the priorities right in terms of the development of the ecosystem and the demand side and saying this is what we need and the two coming together to say well this is what you get um that whole process is really you know you, you need that tension and i think it's what you see today is actually you know it's it, it can be frustrating at times i'm sure for, for some players who say well you know aspects of the ecosystem aren't quite ready um but that's a natural tension that i think is is important and actually a characteristic of a of of any sort of transforming uh, ecosystem, and if, if you didn't have it, it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be, which right. is probably more problematic. And, and how about the um, the service providers, the the communication service providers that have all this five G spectrum? You know, are um, are they working? You know, in this industry and trying to you know help uh, the automotive industry adopt their digital transformation plans with their own spectrum that they have. Maybe, you know, Stefan, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I think that's a part of the ecosystem which will not need any education. Um, uh, they have just like the capabilities on board. Yeah. And we see already just like really a, a lot of successful installations they've done. So I think there's no education or development to be done on their side. They have been engaged with the industry beforehand with different kind of topics. So it's more about the, the, the rest of the ecosystem besides the, the, um, the um, telecommunication providers. They know what they're doing already. Right, right. It's just them having to learn about the automotive industry and what they need uh, in order to make it successful for them. Yeah. They, they might just like face new competition now. As I outlined earlier on, we see just like the IT operation um, companies who operated just like the, the Wi-Fi as of today and are now extending their portfolio in terms of now operating also private wireless systems. So there might be just like a new competition for, for, for them. Um, but still, they are, to my understanding, already um, aware about what's happening and, and that they are most skilled in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. What do you say, Phil, as far as the service providers? Are they ready to be able to help the automotive industry adopt 5G? Yeah, I think so. You know, uh, Stefan's right. I mean, they know what they're doing with 5G. They know what they're doing with mobile technologies. That's their bread and butter. Um, one one thing I'd say, which I, I do find it sort of interesting, is is the um, 
tele telecom operators from a from because of the complexity of 5g have sort of uh they, they tend to operate in a world where you manage complexity mm -hmm. the it world tends to operate in a in a world where you sort of abstract complexity right and it's the whole idea of sort of what you do in a virtualized environment how you take away some of that uh, operational complexity, they're more orientated towards automation. Um, and so you do have this sort of convergence of, of worlds. Um, and I think what some people will perhaps there's a risk of underestimating the role of OT, right? So, so we kind of, we have a tendency of thinking of, of telecom operators in, in, uh, from the perspective of their role relative to IT, which tends to put telecom operator almost sort of in an environment, kind of almost like a Wi-Fi type of environment, right? Mm -hmm. When you start talking about 6 nines performance um, and those sorts of, uh, you know, really high availability, when you start talking about integrating supply chains or you start talking about after sales support, you start talking about the role in connected vehicle and so forth for um, uh, the, the service component of a car maker's business, um, the role of the operator becomes really important. And so I think it's still shaking out, right, where we've got a lo lot of momentum behind private networking. Right. Um, and, you know, where does that sit relative to, to the public network? Uh, where does that sit in terms of things like network slicing and so forth, um, yeah. both private and public? And I, I think that'll shake out. But as it shakes out, that uh, I think the, the wide area mobility as well as the 6.9 type performance are two aspects that really do play in into the uh, favor of of, of the, the network operators who really understand this technology. Okay, yeah. So there's probably going to be some different types of 5g networks maybe some that are private networks that are you know just deployed on the factory uh, premises and industrial complexes but then there's going to be as you said the service providers you know providing the wide area network coverage and perhaps some slicing that is going to take place mm. um stefan you know um i i guess you know from a um supply chain perspective, tracking the ability to track um, their uh, components and their vehicles across uh, the network is pretty important for them, right? Absolutely. Just like when we talk about logistic use cases, um, telecommunication provider will be mandatory. So it's yep. just like there's no doubt. So that, that's just like that defines that they have just like a mandatory place in, in the in this industry but i would maybe use that also to outline there there's a little bit more it's just like beside the logistic use cases we have for example the over the air updates which are right. currently planned basically to be done in the, in the public network but when we look on the on the on the 5 gaa they have just like defined the different over the air updates update use cases and they've clustered them a bit and they're they have a recommendations which is saying that there are some critical updates which still need to be done on, on the retailer side yeah. and why not using this technology to do over the air updates at the retailer in a private network so it's just like we will see when we just like have a look on germany we've got 40 50 million and cars running on the streets of course, they are not all connected, but looking in the future, imagine this kind of amount of cars is getting an update on a regular basis. This will just like put a lot of traffic into the public network. So why not using just like public networks for over the air updates on one hand, but for specific updates, why not doing that in a, in a private network at a retail level? And that's just like there are a couple of benefits besides just like reducing the, the traffic in the public network. It's, it's a big benefit for the end customer as well, mm -hmm. meaning they get just like the, the update pretty fast, better than in, in any other network because you've got just like the guarantee for, for the bandwidth. And that maybe also gives just like a, a different feeling or that changes all, also the, the, the client related to a certain extent because they have just like a guaranteed fast um, and a secure download mm -hmm. at a retailer, which enables the OEM also just like to, to interact with the client again in a positive manner. 
and that really can just like and that needs to be managed as well between public and private networks right right yeah so there's going to probably be some combination of public private and maybe hybrid right phil uh, models that uh, will take place uh, in uh, the automotive industry oh definitely yeah i mean i i, I could you know you already have the momentum behind private um you can see where the car companies are extending their business models, which imply the need for, for wide area connectivity, yeah. um, which, which, which Stefan's talked about some of the use cases there of, you know, such as over the air updates and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you, you inherently need some kind of public network to, to support that. And then if you think about the, the, the product lifecycle management, the way in which you, you're uh, developing and, and delivering these technologies, you know, these vehicle technologies to market, the combination of both becomes more important over time. And it just comes down to an economic issue at the end. You know, if you're trying to, what is the best technology to, to de reliably deliver the services that you're trying to offer? And that's sure. why I think both play a role. Um, obviously, there's a lot of commercial considerations around commercial mo you know, models and the way in which the different stakeholders interact to make this come to bear. But fundamentally, you're going to need both, uh, both of those, I think, both those worlds uh, to exist or coexist. So public, private, and hybrid. Okay. Yeah, and I... Um... One thing that we haven't touched base on yet, um, which I mentioned in my initial comments, was around uh, the area around sustainability and being able to, you know, the automotive industry being able to meet their um, carbon uh, emissions um, objectives. Um, there's more pressure on them to do so. So, um, you know, how does the uh, evolution of the automotive industry uh, of the combustion engine more towards EV vehicles? impact their digital evolution and sustainability goals um, and what their, their plans are. Uh, Stefan, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, just like electric drive is currently one of the key topics for the automotive industry to meet their carbon footprint targets. But maybe let's just like try to step into our technology back again when it comes to the carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. For example, the combination of high bandwidth and low latency allows the uh, HV or AMR manufacturers to transfer um, more computing power to the local edge, and what does that mean? This reduces basically the the power needs of the of the devices and extend their operation operating time. Mm -hmm. In other words, they need less charging time, or they can reduce the battery capacity, and both contributes to the OEM carbon footprint as well. So, from that perspective, it's just like the big picture. Of course, is the car itself, but I think the the, the private 5G technology also allows the um, or contributes to their to their um, carbon footprint in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Phil, I, what do you think about um, car, the carbon footprint and evolution of um, mm. the automotive industry and meeting their uh, digital transformation and uh, sustainability goals? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, that, so so Stefan's made a really good point in terms of making the technology more efficient mm -hmm. you know you think of this as kind of like a data center on wheels so so or a car is a data center on wheels so so what as that occurs kind of how do you how do you do that more efficiently and where do you need or benefit from connectivity so that's one area another area is you know uh that that we've looked at is is just around the battery technology yeah um and so if you think of the life cycle of uh sure. you know an ev battery for example Right. So um, today, uh, 70 plus percent of the materials come from Asia. You, you, you're pushing that to, to North America and Europe. So there's there's a huge carbon footprint there, which and you've got rare earth metals and so forth. And in both the the um, uh, motor components as well as in the battery technologies and so forth. So so there's a lot of uh, supply chain considerations that become important. And, that, and there's a need to shift from, a, if you like, a linear economy where you go and get your materials, you build your product, and then you 
you bury it in the ground, right? Mm -hmm. To create more of a circular economy where you're recycling this technology and you're managing the technology right through the product cycle, which means that's where I was talking before about digital twinning um, at the, you know, today there's a lot of work in terms of optimizing battery cell design so that the battery will last longer. Um, the battery will perform better and be more efficient in the charging processes and so forth. Well, there's a there's a whole product life cycle uh, a consideration that becomes important there, all the way from how that battery is produced to the way in which it's managed through the charging cycle, all the way back to that the the the, the, the recycling process of that that technology. And so I think you know as you start to look at those um, sort of circular economies, if you like. Um, the management of product right through that cycle becomes really important, which means you need to have connectivity. You need to have that 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 real time understanding of of what's happening with the technology through that cycle. Mm -hmm. And you know, a five G technology plays a role there, right, in terms right. of ensuring that it's optimized through that cycle. Yes. And I think a lot of other aspects of the product will be the same. Right. Well, you know, this has been a real uh, awesome conversation, uh, very insightful. Um, I really want to thank Bill and Stefan for all of your great insights. Um, I'd like you uh, to be sure to visit both uh, the websites, Nokia's.com automotive um, manufacturing website, where you can find the latest report on the automotive industry from Phil and Taloga Research at uh, www.taloga.com, where you can learn more about the 5G industry. So I want to say thanks again to Stefan and Phil for this great um, conversation. Uh, thanks for everyone for uh, watching us. Have a great day. Thank you very much, Steve. Thanks, Steve.